Uh, my name is Marty. I'm with the USGS in Central Connecticut. I'd just like to say I got my start working with DTS technology outside Copenhagen in 2009 with Scott, John, and a few other folks. Um, I, that might have been pre-CTEMPS days, but that um, is an experience I will always appreciate and has certainly influenced my career. And, and through the USGS, we continue to collaborate with academics who borrow instruments and receive guidance from CTEMPS, uh, and we do that to this day. Okay, so this talk's short presentation is just going to be given from the perspective of river corridor, surface water, groundwater exchange type investigations. And this is just to set the stage an image of a small pond just uh, adjacent to Walden Pond in Massachusetts, if you're familiar with Thoreau and those writings. But basically, this is a sand and gravel deposit. We expected that discharge would be kind of ubiquitous along this bank. You're seeing what happened that the dam failed. This, this pond drained and we came back a few years later to check up on our research site and we see that essentially all the groundwater coming to this pond was coming out of one macro pore that was formed where uh, an old stump had been in the in the in the lake bed there and um, you can see all the iron rich, rich water coming out and these are the locations that we don't want to miss because it seems that groundwater surface water exchange is just inherently preferential in space even in highly permeable sediments where you expect it to be more well distributed. Thankfully, there's a thermal signature, in this case, to colder groundwater coming into warmer surface water. This is an infrared image, but this is the, the type of data we'd like to pick up with on a cable that's laid out along the bottom of this pond, or that most of the data I'll show you today were from streams and rivers. But the real key and what I want to hammer home here today is, is georeferencing of this cable because it might be clear to you if you've worked with this type of instrument before or you know, paid attention to the talks today, that the data are not inherently spatially referenced. Okay, so you're, you're pulling out your cable, you collect data, and hopefully you see something interesting. See the plot in the middle of the screen there is, is temperature over time by distance over a kilometer. Those vertical blue bands are actually groundwater seeps or springs that are kind of consistent cold spots over time. But we don't know where on the Earth's surface that is. What we'd really like to do is get to like a plot on the right and see is that that's an, an ortho image that has data plotted. It's condensed over time. So we're seeing mean temperature. We've got dots that indicate the standard deviation or the variance of temperature because groundwater tends to buffer uh, inherent changes in stream temperature. So that helps us locate these preferential zones of groundwater discharge. But we need to georeference that cable. Um, Another thing you can do with fiber optics, I think this was spoken about earlier, is you, you can wrap it around a core and, and increase that uh, apparent resolution in the vertical. So going from something like half a meter to a centimeter in the vertical. In this case, we're heating up some of these vertical profilers we put down into the stream bed to pick up on flux rates and, and different types of sediment uh, with depth. Again, georeferencing is quite important. So how are you going to do it? I mean, you can buy a cable that has a marking on the jacket that indicates kind of distance along the stream that you can then reference to a known point. Uh, sometimes a handheld GPS, and these have gotten better over time, is good enough. I mean, if you're putting it down the center of a, a stream and, and you're just trying to get kind of a, a, a rough picture of what's happening, a handheld GPS might be enough, or you may need to survey um, these points in with an RTK GPS, or in this case, a total station, as shown there in the image. So it really depends. Um, the conceptual model here shows some very discrete groundwater discharge that trout are utilizing at the 10 centimeter scale. In that case, we might need to get pretty precise with our spatial referencing. Uh, the data on the right shows um, a fiber optic cable laid along a bank uh, on a trout stream. And you can see there's, there's differences between the right bank and the left bank, even though the stream is only four meters wide. But again, those vertical bands tend to in indicate groundwater discharge points that the trout may use to spawn. So another example here is where we've got a cable just zigzagged all over the place. You can see that red line. This is a permeable reactive barrier that's intercepting phosphorus discharge to a lake on Cape Cod, Massachusetts. And we've interpolated um, data between where the cable is laid. Again, if we know where those turn points are and we pull that cable straight, we can interpolate that data over space, but we need to know where those points are 
And we'd like to do that rather quickly, potentially in the field to help guide sampling in kind of quasi real time. So just to take a look at what this, this data is showing us, you can see that permeable reactive barrier is that thin uh, red box. This is in the evening and then the next morning as the lake cools, we see these pockets. We're, we're often anomaly hunting. Uh, and th in this case, is indicating these preferential groundwater discharges that in this case happen to mostly be going around the permeable reactive barrier instead of through it. Um, but that's a different issue. So to help us process this data and, and really kind of do it quickly in the field as the data is coming in, um, as well as kind of run some simple statistics that may indicate preferential groundwater surface water exchanges and, and other uh, aspects of your data you might be interested in. This, this GUI is applicable to other types of applications beyond the river corridor. Uh, we've got this DTS GUI that was released earlier this year. Um, this is free software. I won't read off all these points to you, but it's, it's based right now around the Celixa and Oryx instrument files. So it'll bring those files in, um, kind of aggregate them, and then you can trim the data, as I'll show you in a couple of screens here, in space and time, create subsets of the data that you might be able to work with, bounce them out in ASCII files and, and work with them in other programs quickly. It calculates basic, basic statistics such as standard deviation, min, max, mean temperature by distance. Um, and it does the georeferencing if you have known cable points or known, you know, an optical distance that you can relate to a point on the Earth's surface or a depth in the stream bed. So you can start to kind of understand how the data relates to the real world rather than just kind of the matrix of temperature that's on your computer. And it'll automatically plot these either single traces or summary statistics on Google Maps if, if that's the kind of deployment you have kind of in plan view. So here is some example data and these are windows from the GUI. Um, upper left, so this is, if you're not used to looking at this type of data, this probably looks like a mess, um, but we've got a uh, time on the Y and distance on the X. And so there's a bunch of cable wrapped around the spool that's up on shore where it says trim, then it goes through our ice bath and then it goes out along the stream. And here there's a whole lot of action, a lot of groundwater discharge, those vertical bands indicate kind of focused springs that dominate discharge to the stream. But we've got some earlier time data we might wanna trim off. Uh, we might wanna trim off the, the spool and the ice bath from the analysis that we're relating to fish habitat here in our lower left plot. And then often, you know, we'll run cables in different directions from a control unit because we're limited in kind of the practical length of cable we can carry. In this case, these cables are about a kilometer long. We've got the control unit in the middle. You can see in, in plan view on the right, uh, this is another image from the GUI. We run a cable upstream, we've run one downstream, and we can kind of put all that data together in space. And, you know, this, everything's pretty straightforward to do this in the field. This can let us go out and say, okay, where is this cold spot? Do we see fish here? What is the you know, dissolved oxygen concentration of the groundwater coming out here? And start to really do some survey, use, this, use DTS as a survey tool in more real time, rather than a, these kind of longer post-processing steps that don't allow you to kind of adapt in the field. Here is another data that just looks like kind of a mess. This is a double-ended measurement that you know, some folks were talking about earlier. This is the machine calibrated data. Um, but basically, if we've taken positions for all these places the cable turns in the GUI, we can plot this quickly in space. I can look for places. What's plotted here is actually a standard deviation. So those purpley colors are indicating buffered temperatures. And this is endangered dwarf wedge mussel habitat, and they tend to cluster around seeps. And this allowed us to find um, some mussel beds that we didn't even know were there uh, pretty quickly and, and able to plot up this kind of complicated um, cable deployment. In, in the field. And you can also bring in your own base map. It doesn't have to be one of these uh, kind of Google map stock images. Uh, in this case, this is actually data generated by air sea temps along the East River in Colorado. This is part of a quasi training course in, in 2016, I believe. So this is, we've got kind of a meander bend. You can see mean temperature on your left. We've got some cooler areas in the meander bend, uh, standard deviation is lower there. We interpret that as a kind of cross meander bend hyperreak exchange. But this is basically a, a 3D model generated from the, the drone imagery that we're able to plot this data right on in space uh, quickly all within the GUI. And 
I will leave it there so that the URL to download the software at standalone um, is, is listed there, as well as my email. So feel free to reach out if you want to discuss this. Um, again, this GUI is kind of based around working with instrument calibrated data. And I know a lot of folks on this call maybe calibrate their data outside of, of the instrument files using the raw data. And I think that's great depending on the application. Um, and we're working on an update for this where we can bring in, instead of the instrument files, a more general file format that might come out of like the, the CTEMPS GUI in MATLAB that could then be uh, dropped right into here. So that's it, thank you. Thanks, Marty. Um, are there any questions? I, this is Scott. I can just make a comment that I and I put it in the chat box. But we had the same conversation yesterday in the distributed acoustic sensing workshop of knowing where your cable is, and 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 I can't. Uh, Marty had said it so clearly that knowing where things are is so important, and it's so easy to overlook it. So thanks, Marty. Great. Yeah, thank you, Scott. It's 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 interesting because we all kind of know that it's not inherently georeferenced, but once you've done the experiment and, and get home, all you have is the data you have. And if you don't have enough to cover the curvature of the stream or wherever you've deployed it, you might have some really interesting, compelling temperature data, but not it might not be useful <laughs> without that georeferencing. Right. Now, another thing to watch out for is clocks. You know, when you get instrumentation from C temps, for example, we're on West Coast time for the most part. Um, you have to decide as a project, do you want to set all your clocks to UTC, for example? We recommend that so that when there's a time change due to season, for example, or if an uh, instrument's been shipped um, after repair from England, um, these things don't mess you up. So look at your timestamps very, very carefully. Make sure that all your instruments are, are, are synchronized. That's a very big challenge. Particularly in the aerial deployments, which Chris Thomas showed, we literally need to have, have a reference within a millisecond. And so that really takes attention to, to get those um, tight uh, time stamps. Um, since we've got about two minutes left here to, before we go to Chadi and, and to keep, keep us from getting ahead of schedule, uh, I'd just like to add that what we're talking about mapping the cable and figuring out what parts of the cable are where in your physical layout. Um, one of the things you can commonly do is create, do something to create some type of temperature contrast. So if you're working in a cold environment, you could have something warm to wrap around the cable while someone is at the DTS making a measurement and see where they see a, a temperature spike. Um, hopefully you can create that, that much of a temperature contrast will, where it will be apparent to them. And uh, then it can be noted at what distance uh, on the at DTS, what distance on the fiber, that location um, occurs at, as you see it uh, along the X scale in the data. Um, but um, someone also mentioned that some fibers have the distances marked on the fiber themselves. So it's a good idea to use both of those um, types of referencing 